to another exciting episode of Humanity 8.0, a podcast where we talk about our post-truth present and our transhuman future, with the aim of sketching out the outlines of what awaits us in the years and the decades ahead of us. This podcast is brought to you by Rokos. Companies with limited IT budgets and personnel can now get the same cybersecurity protection as big enterprises. Rokos' Secure Access Service Edge, SASE solution, with zero trust, provides enterprise-grade comprehensive cybersecurity so that you can focus on your business. For more, please visit www.rokos.com. That's R-O-Q-O-S dot com. And now, here's your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. Um, I worked. I worked at Amazon for a few years, um, and, and there, um, how is how is that? Um, and it's also like move fast and be. A, it's, it's called the the cowboy mentality. Very proudly, right? And it's it's again move fast, break things, and so on. And and so, but the way that the people, um, you know, who are the workers, us, right? People who are actually building things, who are not thinking about conquering the world, but trying to do a, as, as good a job as possible, move fast and break things uh, and fail fast and all, it was all about, you know, being creative. It's all about, right, um, let's not be um, timid, let's, let's try it. things, right? Let's try things, right? So it has, so that's why it has how it's sold, right? And accepted as an ethos. <laughs> you can't be creative unless you fail and fail, fail, fail again. Like Edison, Thomas Edison, or you failed a million times before he found the bubble. So it's sold in that way, not as let's, but but in terms of the executives and all that, I think it's part of an ethos of um, power is 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 the bottom line of everything, right? So just go and break it and see what happens. And you have lawyers and whatever. That's the cost of doing business. And maybe you get some media, um, you know, attention that is negative and so what and so and so on. So you go, they go and break and break things. Um, but as you were saying, right, slowing things down is dangerous to that plan, right? Because it it allows for coalitions to form, I think, right? Allows for uh, folks to negotiate and to resist and to understand to do. I mean, doing research, for example, right? Go ahead. No, yeah, I mean, this is the authoritarian versus a democratic model. I mean, it's slow to build democratic principles. It's exhausting. It's not fun, right? Um, Much better to be the authoritarian if you want stuff to be done quickly and fast, right? But the, it has costs. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, exactly, and the co- the co- the cost I think of a slow moving democracy that is organically and naturally evolving, um, uh, th- that cost is 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 I think sustainable, right? As opposed to the cost of going and just setting the fire, uh, the, the you know the, the Amazon taking half of it, and then, so the cost that is almost non recoverable, right? It's almost permanent. Um, now, the thing that's interesting really is that uh, folks who are creative, folks who are who want to do things um, naively, right, and innocently, they want to solve problems, right? They are very attracted to the mentality of let's go and try things out, right? Uh, and so there is this sort of double, you know, thing that's happening here, right? Folks who want to do things, they want to do things, and so and they're frustrated by slowing things down, right? Um, and so, so how how would how would we sort of um, create a citizen that does create things and is excited when they wake up in the morning to be going back to the lab and doing things and all that, but they have sort of a social conscience at the same time? How do we go? Like, what kind of things could we inject into our educational system so that these folks who are technologists are not completely naive? and build things in a bubble and swallow things from Jeff Bezos when he goes and gives his talk and everybody is like, oh, God is talking. Let's listen to him. Let's follow his example. How, what, what can we do so that when the 22, 23, 24-year-old programmer or product manager goes into Amazon to participate in the building of things, um, they, you know, they, they have, they're far more aware of what's going on um, or maybe they won't join Amazon as a result of that. What do you think? What time you can fix this? Because I don't think it. I think it's fixed from top and bottom. But I'm thinking about the bottom up. 
Yeah, it's really a tough question, right? Because you're asking a question about a worker consciousness, about right. a human consciousness, about how do we learn to care for others and think about power differentials and think about who benefits and who loses and who's at the table and who was never, ever going to be invited. Right. I mean, that starts with conversations about neighborhoods. It starts with conversations about how you live as a kid yep. who wants to go to college and who doesn't. And thinking, yep. right, if you think about any situation from a prison, think about what size you don't even get to look at. And um, I mean, that's sort of a question. How do you raise a good human? Exactly. How do we, you know, help other people as they're on their journey to think a little more broadly, a little more thoughtfully about, you know, who gets to make AI, who controls it, what are the data sets, you know, who's gonna, yeah. you know, where, where are the community, right? What I like about geography is it helps create a wider map of the world for my brain. It allows me to ask questions about, okay, why is Loudoun County have so many data centers? What are the environmental implications of that, right? For the way the internet works. And so maybe the internet's amazing, incredible, and a gift to all of us. And yet certain communities bear the brunt of its operations. And so I think for a young technologist, right, that's such a opportunity to just sort of map out, well, where do these materials come from? Who collected them? What were they paid, right? Mapping out a little bit where stuff comes from and where it doesn't come from, I think is helpful for maybe broadening. But who knows? I mean, Ahmed, I have no idea. No, no, I think that's very useful, actually. Uh, when you mentioned about ge geography, I think it's a nice way of um, trying to sort of broaden, right, your horizon, understand that location is important and population is important and there are different pockets of folks. And, and breaking out of our bubble is actually the hardest thing in the world, I think, you know, um, the bubble where we live. Um, whether it's uh, you know it's privilege bubble or not, I mean the bubbles are 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 so defining of how we we think and how we behave and our misperceptions. Um, so um, let me ask you uh, about the the campaign uh, or part of the campaign, which was interesting. Um, that when you, when when I attended the talk, uh, you guys mentioned how there was some like a demonstration and there was this website about the metro uh, on fire. Do you, I, had, I, have, a, I have a very strong feeling that th those were or orchestrated <laughs> by, by the Uber people, right? Um, it's very easy to round up like 20 folks and give them 10 bucks or some beer money and say, go and do this. And then they disappear into the ether or to build a website. What do you think? Well, I mean, how much of a media, I'm thinking, I'm just trying to touch on to the media push that Uber and company did uh, in their campaign. Yeah, I mean, they have a strong campaign. I was just talking to a worker yesterday who was part of a, I can't remember the phrase he used, Dash. He, he, he works for DoorDash. He, he, he's a dasher. Um, and he exactly. talked about how he had been invited to be I can't remember Dash Council. I can't remember what the name is. Dash Pack something. And they got together, and he realized that it wasn't a group of workers that were invited by DoorDash <laughs> to help uh, shape uh, shape DoorDash policy, but instead it was a group of workers invited to help lobby the state and the federal government to have policies that align with DoorDash's needs. So yes, was Uber doing that? Sure. Do I have documentation of it? No. Um, can I surmise that those protests and those events and those websites were connected to Uber? Sure. There's enough on record, <laughs> thanks to Uber, um, in lots of other cities and countries that we know that they were engaged in those practices, whether they were operative in D.C. or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> is, there, is there an anti-ride-sharing uh, movement, um, like there is an environmentalist movement? Or is it just pockets of resistance here and there? What was the first question? Is there a... Is there a ride sharing like an, an movement? Like movement, like movement that is coherent, that has mission and maybe, I don't know, organizational organizations, as opposed to these pockets of resistance here and there against... I would say that we are in a hot labor autumn. Yeah. I would say that we there is a labor movement. And I would think that gig workers are definitely part of that. 
We know in the DC region, we're on our third iteration of a gig worker organization based this time in Northern Virginia. Um, Yes, there are pockets of resistance, but I think we would do an injustice to them if we didn't read them as part of the labor movement. Um, That being said, I think... I think that their success as only labor groups and labor resistors, um, there there are limits to that. And I hope that what we see in the next iteration of gig worker resistance um, is more of a reassessment of gig gig works effect on a city at large. So what I mean by that is thinking about the bargaining for the common good labor model or organizing model, this idea of, you know, teachers in Chicago, for instance, were not just arguing for themselves to get better pay, but mm-hmm. they were arguing for nurses yeah. to be present for libraries, for other things. So they were bargaining for the common good. And I think one of the lessons that I take away from Prop 22 in California is that arguing on labor alone is not going to win against these Silicon Valley companies. And so what I hope is going to play out in Massachusetts with a ballot initiative there, which is a copycat Prop 22 issue, is going to be that we are going to have environmentalists concerned about all these forever chemicals that are getting put on the road by all these vehicles, right? I think people that urbanists that care about congestion and traffic are going to be upset because they know that these vehicles are empty to 40, 60% of the time on the road. So a coalition of folks that are upset, not just about labor, but about its effects on disability rights, effects on urban mobility, effects on environmental, you know, sustainability, that when we have that kind of bar, we have that kind of conversation about the common good, that we will have more of a movement and that it will move beyond the labor movement to these larger questions about how do you build decent places? Yeah. And I think that's a turning point. I don't know that we're seeing it yet, but I hope that that is, an, I, my sense is that's where I, I'm i wrong about a lot of things, but my gut is that that's going to be a shift we could see. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I think it, it makes a whole lot of sense for all these movements to, um, you know, to coalesce or to at least coordinate Right, because obviously it's like uh, it's it's going to be a lot more of a punch when when representatives of labor and the environment and the disability and so forth are are part of negotiations as opposed to only one where it feels like to the public when they hear labor and this is one of those misconceptions oh they're just going trying to raise their salary right so I'm not part of that who cares right they're just as selfish as the company right as opposed to Right, a much broader, more more varied, and so do you. Is there is there anything that is trying to sort of coordinate amongst these? Because as as you know, nothing happens by itself, right? No coordination, especially. <laughs> you know, the labor. Is there somebody? I mean, is it is it the political movement in that sense? Is the, is the political party supposed to be doing that, bringing all these constituencies together? Because I have given up hope on the on the DNC. To be honest with you, it's an establishment party. It's not going to do anything that challenges the. The, uh, you know the money the interests um and so is it is is it you know theoretically or practically uh getting these folks together is is what a political movement a political party should do maybe <laughs> i don't could know be, could there be an uber uh, not uber so i'm not going to use that word um you know an umbrella of uh i mean there are there are there are movements there are groups there are conferences there are stakeholder things there are conversations i was even on a call this week about how to develop one i mean this stuff is cooking yeah yeah okay people are trying to cook it now how many times do we have to fail at it if we're going to fail forward right i just heard something exciting this week which i haven't confirmed but that a worker in dc was able to get paid family leave no bye A gig worker from the city, a gig worker is able to apply. Now, I need to confirm that. I don't know if it's true, but um, I was tipped off to that. And I'm curious to find out, right? I mean, we know now the state of New York is offering, you know, um, any any ride hail driver in the state is going to get minimum wage and paid sick leave. Oh, okay. Right. This is a very different story than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, takes, like we said, it takes time and things evolve, right? As long as there are people involved. Here's the thing that I have never been able to understand, and that's probably because I haven't even 
either, either I have not thought through it as, as deeply as I should, or I'm missing a couple of data points, which is the following. Why aren't companies, right, like Amazon and all those folks um, pushing to have universal health care, um, first of all, so that they don't they have do. They do. Wasn't Walmart one of the biggest pushers of that back in the day? Yeah, but like single payer universal health care. You know, I don't know enough about what they are or are not. I just remember that Walmart was one of the biggest pushers of that. It was at 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, but they were pushers, I think, of a certain kind of, as opposed okay. to... So, Maybe I don't know. You know, like socialized medicine. Yeah, they call it socialized medicine. Socialized yeah. for me is not a dirty word, right? Of course um, not. Right? Um, but some, for some people it is. But let's say, you know, a place like uh, a civilized place, like France or Germany or Canada or even Cuba, right? You break your foot, you go, fix it, you're done, right? And why do they do that? Because they understand that the infrastructure of a civilized place or a place that is humane is going to take care of its folks because when they are active, they produce more than when they are sitting down, right? Uh, so it's sort of like, right? And so for me, I have always been puzzled by why haven't we got, if, if the Democratic Party is run by these modern interests and so on, it seems to me that companies would benefit from having all these folks being covered, okay? You get your disability from the gun, it doesn't come out of my pocket, you know, your medicine, whatever, you know, you just come and work for me and then, and then that's it. I don't, I don't right? Um, and so I never figured out maybe one thing that I, uh, one thing that sort of came to mind that I is there is they like the fact that they keep you hostage, right? Like you're always under anxiety. I can't lose my job <laughs> because I will lose my medical insurance. I don't know if that's conscious or not. That's always uh, been a question for me. Um, so we go back to moving fast, moving slow, democracy, getting involved, right? Uh, and how that is antithetical to how these guys want to go and conquer, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and as we, and, and the hope I think is that, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's a lot, a lot of things going on. Um, and usually things go on and on and then they coalesce, which is, which is great, right? All of a sudden, it feels like it came out of nowhere, but it took a long time to get there, right? Like the labor movement, everybody declared it dead for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, a couple of things happened. I think COVID had something to do with it, right? All things, things, something happened, and now, now it's alive again. And hopefully now it means that the middle class is going to become a thing because I think it's, it has almost disappeared, I would say. Uh, what do you think about that, about the fact that uh, the labor... I mean, the labor movement is, is, uh, is alive. Hopefully it will strive. Um, it will grow. And hopefully a, there's a result. There's an infection in a positive way of that on social, on other social movements. What do you think? Uh, yes, of course, right? I mean, this is, we're in an exciting moment where things are building, right? We're very different than 40 years ago. Um, or even 10, I think even 10 years ago, I think 10 years ago, there was a lot of naivete. What do you think? I think there are a couple absolutely. of- Absolutely. I mean, 2008, think of like post-recession. I mean, that was a moment in which, I mean, Uber really benefited even yes. to bring the full circle from that. I was- um, at a conversation earlier this fall with someone who worked at the Department of Labor in that period and said that the Obama administration was interested in supporting Uber in part because it helped make it look like the country was back at work. I mean, I think that um, the labor movement, right, had so many losses for so, so long. And now we look at Sean O'Brien and we look at the UAW and there this is a moment of excitement. Is it going to hold? I hope. Um, yeah. Well, but, I mean, it, yeah. but but these things add up, right? And we. Um, well, the thing is, is uh, is that is that there is there is there is a count. There are there's always a counter movement, right? We gain. Yes. Two steps it, forward, one step back. Yeah. It it, it just uh it, it just has to. We just have to understand that, like when we when we gain terrain, right? Yeah. We have to whether we can keep it or not. We have to hold it. <laughs> well, it's sort of to bring it full circle. It's also like a law. We can get a law, but you have to maintain it and reinforce it and you know protect it over time. And if not, you lose it. Okay. Um, we have five minutes uh, to go. I know you have to take off or maybe uh, six minutes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you about um what cities Uber has failed to conquer, right? Um, and number two. Uh, I visit. I you know I have a brother in France, so I've been there uh, many times the last few months. Uber is there, 
um, and you know, I asked for Uber and I get it. Um, to the extent that you know the difference between how it operates over there, because France, Paris, and all that, they're very, very, you know, it's so it's basically a, you can call it a socialist place in a good way. Although, you know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's going in the other direction. But number one, give me a city where it failed, where Uber failed to conquer, and why. And then, what's the delta between how things operate here and France, to the extent that you, or any other country, to the extent that you know? Yeah, that's a great question. So, in terms of cities where Uber has failed to succeed, we can think about Glasgow or Edinburgh. We can think about Uppsala or Stockholm, right? There are places with well established public transit or private chauffeur services mm -hmm. that did not fall to Uber. Um, when we think about France and what's happening there, right, France is a really interesting case uh, because of the way in which its immigrants who are the primary workforce for these, for Uber and all of its peer platforms, um, how these immigrants have organized. Um, they've also, unfortunately, right, been really retaliated against, against these, by these companies because there's a whole rentiership process yeah. happening there where immigrants arrive and it's sort of like the new Ellis Island yeah. like when you arrive in Amsterdam or you're moving somewhere you know you arrive in Rio um what's an easy way to make money if you're not literate or you're not able to speak the local language well you can sign up on one of these apps and deliver or if you have access to a vehicle you can ride yeah. you know pick up rides um and so a lot of these companies in France have done these very bulk uh, deactivations mm -hmm. whenever demand goes down. So they're happy to have all these workers, these, you know, what do you say, person sans papier? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, working on their apps when there's high demand, but when demand goes down, suddenly, oh my goodness, we found issues with 2,000 people's paperwork and yeah. they're deactivated. So it's really sort of like the... Um, yeah, cynical. Yeah, but it's it's that surplus population, right? Where they can be yeah. brought in and ejected at will. Um, yeah, fungible. So in, yeah. in France, so there have been really strong courier move. There's been a strong courier movement that I think has bled over into thinking about Ride Hill and other kinds of apps that have been operating there. Um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to, uh, uh, I have three minutes with uh, Katie J. Wells uh, that I'm going to consume. Uh, with your help. So here are some lessons that I have learned reading your book and thinking through things. Number one, in a movement where somebody, where the opposition wants to move fast, move slow, and where they want to move slow, move fast. <laughs> okay. Um, establish, uh, I think, establish facts on the ground. They did that. It's sort of like, all right, here we are, right? It's, what are you going to do about it, right? Um, building public support is crucial. Um, I think attacking the whole problem Right. As opposed to like, uh, for instance, not just um, solve the cab problem, but also solve the income inequality problems Solve the right. There are many. So think about all those things when you're trying to build um, a sort of a movement or, or or conquer something that has to do with the government. Um, I think identify the ecosystem. Right. Um, like who are all the stakeholders and then harmonize them. Right. So sort of like <laughs> to the extent that you can. Um, and then mobilize them to put, I put these things down as I was talking to you in reading the book, mobilize, uh, mobilize, um, mobilize the coalition uh, to put pressure. Like those guys, they had like, I don't know, thousands of people send emails and tweets and right. And 50,000 in 24 hours. Yeah. Right. And, the, and I asked you this question and I'm, I'm always bedeviled by, again, many things bedevil me. He's like, well, why don't, why don't we do that? Go and, you know, we care about, for example, I've done laws, right? Why don't we get 50,000 emails and just, why don't we do that? Is it because they have money? They're organized. They, you know, they 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 play the long game. I don't know. Um, what else? And then also the last thing is is understanding the opponent's strategy. Like what is their strategy, uh, so that we are not playing the dark, right? You know, if and and so if we were in two thousand and nine and knew all those things, I'll, this is the last word for you. Uh, if we were in two thousand and nine and you all knew all and we had such perfect foresight, um, what would you recommend? The three things that folks should do to start of pushback against Uber in 2011? Oh, I love that question. Um, <laughs> I love that question. Oh, 
I guess the first thing that comes to mind, right, is about gathering together a strong coalition of people who want to articulate and can articulate what good public transit or public infrastructure looks like. That means bringing together the folks who care about good jobs for first generation immigrants. It means bringing together people who care about disability rights. It means bringing together urbanists who care about congestion pricing or transportation, right? Um, And getting those people to understand their common struggle and that there can be a common vision of urban life to which they adhere. Um, So does that mean having a class? Does that mean having a conference? Does that mean having a thousand meetings with ANCs? You know, um, I don't know what it looks like in reality, um, but it certainly could have looked differently had Greater Greater Washington, which was a little bit of that, had Greater Greater Washington um, taken a different position on Uber it would have been interesting to see whether Uber was still able to succeed. So Katie Wells, thank you so much for, uh, first of all, writing this book and for making the time to be with me. Thank you uh, for all the insights that you have uh, uh, provided me with. And I look forward to speaking with you some more and interacting with you in the future. Ahmed, this was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye, Ahmed. Thank you. Bye-bye, You've been listening to Humanity 8.0 with your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. Brought to you by Rokos. Thanks for listening.